Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you, God bless. Time to redo the prayer tape. And a good subject for that day that we communicate with Him. Prayer, where it is used most often, both in the Hebrew and the Greek, means intercession, petition, uh, praise. Uh, it's, there are several Greek and Hebrew words that are used for prayer, but they all basically mean to communicate with our Father. It's simply to talk to Him. There is no special ritual involved therein or anything of that nature. He's your Father, and you talk to Him. But many people would say, well, how do I know he hears me? Well, he does hear you. Now, whether he'll answer you or not, there are stipulations within our Father's Word that you must apply to your own life to be able to communicate with him and to feel that he has heard you. By feeling, I mean that he has answered you. And you could, there's one thing you can rest assured of, that he will... He, if you are, that is to say, if you have applied to his word in those things that you are supposed to commit in the word to him and to yourself and those around you, that he will answer your prayer and that that is best for you. So naturally in prayer, faith has a great deal to do with it. You'll remember how many times Jesus would say, thy faith has made thee whole, or thy faith has caused me to grant. And so it, so it, faith has a great deal to do with it, and faith is something that must come from within you. You must believe that Christ was the Son of God. That's necessary. Why is it then that you always pray to the Father, but you always ask it in His name, Christ's name? Because that is your stamp or your seal that you're a believer, that you believe Christ was the Son of God, therefore you ask in His name. Uh, and that lets our Father know you are a believer. He knows anyway, but it's, that's the reason you do ask. So, inasmuch as faith is involved, let's go to a few scriptures and see if we can't pick up on some of the qualifications uh, the, that allow us to be heard of God, to know that our petition to Him has been heard, and that we have done it primarily. I mean, this is the most important thing is that everything we have done will allow us to know that he heard us and will act on it. Because if you're not, if you are not in compliance with those things that he has very simply brought forth concerning prayer, he's not going to answer you. Let's cover what some of those things, it's very basic, very simple. And again, what better day to do it on? Let's go with it. Let's go to the, J the book of James in the New Testament. I'm going to begin reading just with the first uh, chapter. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. In other words, this written to God's election. It's written to everyone on the level whereby they have ears to hear. Two. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. That's a strange statement, isn't it? Count it joy when temptations come to you. Different kinds. Why, why would you do that? Three, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. It gains you patience, and certainly that's something that we're all short of. So always know when temptation comes along that um, it is a trying of your patience, and you're going to get checked out, all right, naturally. So many times we fall short, but at the same time, overall, you will gain patience by it. Verse 4, but let patience have her perfect work. That's to say complete work, better said, 
that you may be perfect or mature and entire. That's to say, and wanting nothing or lacking nothing. Patience really rounds out and causes also your faith to grow. Patience in giving God uh, credit for having heard you and letting him answer as is best for you. Verse five, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. In other words, he gives you that wisdom and upbraideth not. He doesn't chide uh, you for not having known and it shall be given him. That is one thing, if you study God's word, you don't, it does not come through for you, then ask him to allow the Holy Spirit to explain it. I assure you, if you, with faith, knowing that he will, that understanding and that wisdom will be given you. All wisdom comes from God. And um, with that patience, God is always anxious to answer that prayer for more knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Verse six, but let him ask in faith. If you're gonna ask God something in prayer, ask it in faith, nothing wavering. Do you know what that word wavering in the Greek means? Nothing doubting. If you're a doubter, forget it. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. It doesn't amount to anything. What is a wave? It, um, it simply is wind driving water and the water is the same and the wave is gone. All right? God <clears throat> does not appreciate those that are doubters. Faith is um, proof True faith is proof that there's no doubt present. Doubting present means that your faith doesn't amount to a whole lot. And, and perhaps, we should, perhaps we should take our time and explain what doubting means. It's, it's all right to wonder whether God will see your request that is best for you, but to doubt that he will hear and will answer for what is best for you, he may not do it your way, he'll do it his way, and if you turn it over to him, knowing beyond any shadow of a doubt, no wavering, that he will answer it for that that is best for you over the long run. That's exactly how he will answer it, and you can count on it. Our Father never lets us down. Verse seven, for let, no man, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Don't, don't think for a moment. You can pray all you want to. You're not going to receive anything from God if you're a doubter. You're wasting your time. You're not going to waste his because he will ignore you. Having heard, then will ignore. You can't be a doubter. That shows lack of faith and even your sincerity in our Father's word itself. Many people fall into that category, unfortunately. But you must understand, and the way to perhaps to overcome doubt again is what I mentioned a moment ago, is to trust and love your father enough to know that he's going to answer it for what is best for you. That gives you patience because you can erase it, I mean, your mind can be at ease or you can have peace of mind knowing that and go along your merry way without any problems whatsoever. Hey, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go on over to the book of Peter, First Peter following this book of James. And we find here in First Peter, oh, let's go over to chapter three. Again, bearing in mind from that first chapter of James, if you're a doubter, God's not going to give you anything. All right, so number one, never be a doubter. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 3, 
And let's pick it up here about the seventh verse, if we may. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together, equally together, of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, if, if you don't do that, your prayers can be hindered. Well, what is, talking, what is it talking about? Well, don't let jealousies or strife, um, the spirit of, um, uh, of argue, uh, don't let these things hinder God hearing your prayers by robbing a couple of their oneness or their equalness in their um, inheritance of grace and life from God, meaning a successful marriage, peace with peace abounding, that um, it, it must be done in this manner, that they must respect each other. It's not difficult to do when you realize, realize you're both one anyway. Verse eight, finally, be ye all of one mind. In other words, Understand the Word of God as best you can, and let one mind know in solid faith, true faith, that our Father is with you, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, or better translated, kind, be kind to each other, be courteous. That's necessary as a group. You do not have to agree on every little detail of God's Word together for, but as long as you agree that it is God's Word and that you do not allow that that you believe to offend someone that might see it differently for God has different purposes and duties for different people. Verse 9 not rendering evil for evil. Now, we were talking about doubt a moment ago. We're talking about evil here. In other words, if somebody uh, dumps garbage in your front yard, don't go dump garbage in his. All right, that's an analogy, and evil usually isn't put out in that way. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessings blessing, knowing that you are thereunto called. That's why God called you, that you should inherit a blessing. In other words, that's the manner. Where do blessings come from? All blessings come from God, All right? In other words, God likes that, and he will bless your family. Ten, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Now, what are we talking about? Again, let's see. A moment ago, he said, if you waver, you're, God's not going to answer you. And here he's saying, if you dispense that that is evil, whether it be from your tongue, your actions, or whatever, what happens? Verse 11, let him eschew evil, let, it, let him evo avoid evil and do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. You, you um, reach for and search for peace, all right? And then what happens? Will you find it? Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord, what is that? The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. In other words, God looks out for the righteous. And his ears are open, here we go, are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So within this, then we see another reason why you're at zero in your prayer life 
if um, you have this evilness, an evil nature, an evil spirit, or just not really a good neighbor, not good to your mate, you really kind of were going to be wasting your time because not only will God not answer your prayer, he's against you. It's not to say that there's any perfect individual for there was only one perfect and that was Christ. But you must try. And in trying, I hope you noted that it mentioned concerning the husband and wife that they are heirs. Heirs of what? Heirs of the promises. I mean, this is a promise. If you try and if you fall short, and repent and try again, God's eyes will be upon you to protect you, to bless you, to see that you find that peace and that things work in your favor. Now, let's add the wavering mind to this. If one wavers or doubts in his mind, well, I don't know if there's a God anyway, and then uh, blesses out his neighbor He's wasting his time. God's going to put the trash bucket in his way. He will. Because it did not say he was neutral in the situation, but that God was against the evil uh, spirit, the evil one, or those that participate in stirring up trouble for those that seek to do in a mature way that that is right with God. Those particular things are very important in your prayer life. There is nothing more beautiful and it is very necessary for you to spend a little time with your father in prayer or if you prefer talking to him, asking him to intercede, asking him for a blessing, asking him for the results in as much as you are an heir, an inheritor of his promises that you seek that promise. He'll give it to you. But those are, the those are the restrictions and the conditions to answered prayer. They're not tough. They are very simple. And our Father would certainly um, expect one to understand that. I don't think anyone, if they doubt if you doubt anyone and do not have faith in them, they're not going to go too much out of their way to uh, help you a great deal. Why should God? It's just simply that you must love him, believe him, trust him. Uh, therefore, he looks out for you. He sees that you receive the breaks. Let's go over to Luke chapter 18 for a moment as we're going a little deeper into this prayer. Let's pick it up, if we may, in the first verse. I like this parable that's given. It lets us see God's heart, his emotion, better said. Verse 18, And he spake a parable unto them in this end, this Christ to them, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. In other words, if you run up against a stump, um, and excuse the colloquialism, but you know what I mean. If you run up with some against something that seems impossible, then don't faint, don't give up. Ask Father for wisdom. Ask for a way around it, whatever that problem or stump might be in your life. It might be trouble with the mate. It could be any number of things, with a boss, with a neighbor, or whatever. Don't despair. Discuss it with your father and apply your father's advice and word to it, saying, this is the parable he gave them. There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded him. He was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. But he was a judge. Verse 3. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. Now, it wouldn't take too much stretch of the uh, strain on the imagination to realize probably this widow is, 
God's children and the adversary in as much as it's the actual name of Satan or one of his names to understand what the prayer is about here in the, the analogy of it. Verse 4, and he would not for a while, I mean that judge could care less, widow woman, you're bothering me, go on. But afterward, he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, verse 5, yet because this widow troubleth me, she's persistent, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. I'd rather give her what she wants and get rid of her because she believes that I can do it. She knows I can do it. And she believes that if I, she continues to ask that I will do it. Do you see the analogy? God is not telling you to be repetitious, but he's telling you when you ask me something in prayer, when you ask me to intercede or be a judgment in your life, don't be repetitious, but do come back to me. Repetitious means uh, to chant, all right? Then the flesh gets in it and it kind of gets a little murky around the edges. But God said, be persistent, don't waver. Verse six, and the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. Think about that. Christ saying, look at what he said. Seven, and shall not God avenge his own elect? Do you think God is not aware of his elect? Of course he is. Which cry day and night unto him, Though he bear along with them, though it takes, though this age has been quite lengthy, do you think God does not know his elect and that he does not take care of them? Eight, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Faith is the love and belief combined therein toward our Father in prayer that causes prayer or the avenger of our, our hurt, which is God himself against the destroyer, Satan, to take place now. God says, touch not mine elect. But the question is, if there's no faith there because of the deception, and look around you today, my friend, it's talking about the return of the Father to this earth through the Son. It says, at that time, because it has taken so long, the big question is not whether God will do it or not, not whether God will answer prayer, but whether there will be faith present that will cause the prayer to be answered. God promises he will if the faith is there. And that is magnificent. It really is. How's your faith, friend? Let's continue right on here, if we may. Verse 9, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. Not God, not somebody else, themselves. That they were righteous and despised others. You know, the old self-righteous hypocritical type is I know everything. If you ever want to know anything, ask me. I'm better than thou. I am just really God's gift to this world. That's what he's talking about. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray. What's the subject? To pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. One was a very religious Pharisee and the other was a sinner, a publican. 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Do you understand that? With himself. I mean, after all, as far as he's concerned, he's the only one there. He's so good. He is so very good uh, that um, because he's his own judge, you know, so naturally, even if there is something wrong, he's, gonna, he's going to, he, he, he will overlook it because he can do no wrong anyway, you understand? He prays with thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, 
or even as this publican, even as that cheap little old jerk standing over there implied, that's, I'm giving you what's in the mind of a hypocrite, all right? Verse 12, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 13, and the publican standing afar off, he was afraid to take the high seat. He was afraid to come to the front, so to speak. Would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven. He dared not because he knew he was a sinner. Are you? I think all of us know that we sin. None of us are perfect, not to the point that we can be self-righteous, all right? It's easy to lie to yourself if you want to because, you know, if you, if you work on yourself long enough, you can convince yourself that you're pretty good people, you know? Other people may not think so, and pretty soon you get so good that you get all messed up if you even get in the same room with someone else, a sinner. Because you, one like that always sees the other person's shortcomings, okay? Uh, this, this sinner knew he was a sinner. And he approached God spiritually in that same mode. But he smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. What is that when he did that? He's repenting. And after Christ would pay the price on that repenting, he was perfect. Do you understand? Because all those sins were forgiven. In other words, don't tell, don't tell old self-righteous over there, but this man is, pre is perfect for this moment. Yeah, he'll sin again. This moment in God's eyes, he's perfect because Christ would have paid the price. 14, I tell you this man went down to his house justified, meaning he was judged and not found wanting, Mark paid in full rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Um, so we see within this another step in prayer. Watch yourself. Don't become a goody goody two shoes. 15, let's continue right on. And they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. Get those kids out of here. He's busy, he's tired, he's been traveling, been teaching. 16, but Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. In other words, you're seeing right here what really a citizen in the kingship or the dominion of God is like. Got it? 17, verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Do you know what he's saying? And this has to do with prayer as well as entering the kingdom. When you are a grandparent or a parent of a toddler, a little child, that child with anxious big eyes when they seek information come to you and they ask a question and they're, they're all believing. They believe whatever you tell them. Their trust is what I'm talking about in faith when they know you're serious. In you is 100%. And their minds accept that and they grab it. And so it is when one is taught the Word of God. As that little child, you must have faith when you understand the manuscripts to accept them and to know that your Father, which is in heaven, who is in that kingdom, will not deceive you as the adversary will, but that you can receive it as a wide-eyed little child your heart knowing it's a fact. Not as that self-righteous hypocrite. 
not as one that participates in evil, not as one that wavers. I'm recapping a bit here. Not as one that wavers, but as a little child, 100% belief and faith that our parent tells us the truth. And this is so easy to document in everyday life. Uh, at uh, my little granddaughter the other day, I was pushing her in the swing and mentioned something about her dad. And she said, well, my dad knows more than you do, Papa. And I said, well, he should know something. I taught him everything he knows just about. And on it goes. But in her mind, her dad knew everything. You got it? And even though it was my son that she's discussing, my dad knows everything. Well, that's how you receive the Word of God because our Father knows everything. I'm talking about our Heavenly Father. And you must receive that Word and truth. And when you talk to Him, strengthen your faith by letting Him know that you know He does. No wavering. How precious it is to communicate with your father in honesty, the honesty of a little one. Those wide eyes in belief, repent, forgive him. Verse four, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. I want to talk about that just for a moment because probably one of the most important things about prayer is as we learned in, the, in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to go there in a moment, but not to this particular verse, is this, that you must forgive if that on repentance, he comes to you, you must forgive, or your prayers will not be answered by God. Now, it is a strange thing to me, but in many years of experience in the ministry as a teacher, many times people overlook the main person that you must forgive. And that's the reason many times their prayers are not heard not adhered to. They forgive everyone else. They're big hearted in that. They do. But they don't forgive themselves. That's very important. Oh, but you don't understand, Brother Murray. I'm such a good person. I don't, I, I knew better than that. I messed up and I just can't hardly seem to forgive myself for that because I know better and I'm smarter than that. <laughs> you weren't. Forgive yourself. You're not perfect. I'm not asking that you use that as an excuse to be negligent in anything, but you must forgive yourself. You see, that's a very humbling experience because before you can forgive yourself, that part of self-repentance is the admission before God, you messed up and you hate it, you're sorry for it and you have a change of heart and mind about it, that's repentance. And then on forgiving yourself, God will hear your prayers again. That isn't brought out and it isn't taught all that much, but it is very important. So again, wavering, It'll block your prayers, doubt, that that is evil, not being kind or gentle to those that are around you when it's possible. Get along with your neighbor if it is possible. That's very scriptural. If it's impossible, God doesn't expect you to. You know, if they, you're, you rebuke them, and if they repent, fine, forgive them. But don't, but it is, you can forgive them in your own heart, which I advise. But uh, then any part you might have had in it, forgive yourself. 
and God will hear your prayers. So we see that self can be very detrimental to our prayer life. If you take on the air of such a wonderful, wonderful Christian that I am, all right? That's a form of self-righteousness if you're not careful because again, everybody falls short. Okay, so forgiveness is very necessary even forgiving yourself for God to hear your prayers. All right, uh, let's go, we mentioned Matthew. Let's go back to that book of Matthew. And I wanna take the same chapter, chapter six, just before Christ goes into what is known as the Lord's Prayer. And I wanna cover some very important parts and uh, um, concerning Prayer. Let's pick it up, if we may, with verse 5, all right? Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, and uh, it reads, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Do you know what a hypocrite is? This word in the Greek means more a play actor. Don't try to con God. Don't play uh, uh, religion. Be honest and be humble. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. In other words, they do it for show. My family's had this pew in this church for three generations now. We're here every Sunday. I mean, my neighbor, I'll rook or do him out of a load of watermelons every time I get a chance. But I fill this pew every Sunday so that men can see me here. And, you know, maybe men see him and trust him because he's a Christian, and then he'll mess them out of their watermelons. You got it? All right. Maybe too many of you don't have to worry about your load of watermelons, but some do. And here we go. Don't do anything for show that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. In other words, that's all the reward they're going to get because God's not going to answer their prayer. They can pray all they want to for show or to stand up before a room and make a loud, boastful prayer. Nothing wrong with making a prayer before a group if it's honest, humble, and... Um, and uh, for the benefit of uh, request. Under the guidelines, we have so far met in the fact that we um, um, know now, don't to waver, don't doubt, don't do things evil, don't be a hypocrite, and be a forgiving one. Verse six, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, Pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. In other words, this does not mean you have to go into a closet. It means you can even, you don't even have to speak it out loud. Your Father hears you, and He will answer. It will be obvious to others that you are a blessed Christian when you use that method. Verse seven, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be there not ye therefore, verse eight, be ye not therefore, like unto them, for your Father knoweth, I repeat, your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before, I repeat, before ye ask Him. He already knows. Well, what is this, what does this mean then, this um, uh, repetition? It means to chant. 
as heathen would, all right, and get the flesh into it. I would remind you of the Baal worshipers when old Elijah was present and they were praying and chanting and singing and asking their gods to come in and stroke the fire on the altar and just on. They went on for all day long. And Elijah sit over on lunch break and, and he tormented them with statements like, Hey men, maybe your God is out to lunch today. Maybe, maybe your God forgot who you are. Just taunting them kind of along like that, Elijah did a little bit. Well, that was all right. But don't chant. Don't get your flesh involved in it. See? Do it as you have been instructed to this point. You know, did you know the Lord really had a prayer in God's Word? Many might say, well, yes, it follows right along there. No, his last prayer, basically. It's written in John chapter 17. And if you ever really want an example of what's important for you to pray and to look forward to in God's overall plan, Jesus kind of said it all in his final prayer as his work was finished. And he speaks to our Father and note that he calls him Father. John 17, and we're going to close this lecture with these thoughts, Jesus teaching you not only how you should pray, but some of the things you should pray for and keep in mind, especially, especially in this generation. Verse 17, chapter 17, verse 1 of St. John. These words spake Jesus, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. In other words, with these deeds, the miracles, the salvation message too. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he may give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. In other words, that he would pay the price that eternal life is available for those that have that faith. It means especially to those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. First fruits, verse 3. And this is life eternal, resurrection if you would, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, that you would know and believe and have no doubt for I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Five, and now, O heavenly, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, uh, with the glory which I had with thee, listen carefully, with thee before the world was, before the creation before the foundations of earth age even, or the one before as far as that's concerned. Six, I have manifested thy name unto the men. I've taught it, set it to record, which thou gavest me out of the world. Uh, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. They've kept God's plan. Were you given to him? Are you one of God's elect? Think about it. Seven. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. They don't waver. They don't have any doubts. That's why they can ask with a surety. Verse eight. For I have given unto them the words these words, beloved, which thou gavest me. He was that word. And they have received them and have known surely that I came not, I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. No wavering, my friend. 
certain, sure knowledge, Emmanuel, God, with us. The miracles documented at nine. I pray for them, that word prayer, Christ praying, his prayer. I pray not for the world, uh, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Do you think he doesn't love you? Verse 10. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. It makes his day. When you talk to him and thank him for that. 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And so we are, one in mind, one in body, in that love, faith, and belief, 12. While I was with them in the world, uh, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Who is the son of perdition? The son that has already been per that promised to die. There's only one, that's Satan. It's documented in Ezekiel chapter 28. Was not Judas, and don't ever let some featherhead t tell you that, or some commentary, it's incorrect. Check out your Greek, understand the word per perdition. There's only one, it's that simple. Verse 13, in other words, Christ, what, what Christ has said here, except Satan and the Nephilim, he has done the work that all except them may obtain salvation if they have the faith. And of course, he's speaking to his election as well. 13, and now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And you can, beloved. 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, uh, even as I am not of the world. We're not of this world age, chosen before the foundations of the world. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil, and he will. Why? Well, why would he leave them here? They have work to do. 16, they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Well, what is truth? Thy word is truth. And so it is, and that's where you're sanctified. The prayer of Christ 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. Some of you ever felt you had a destiny? Some of you ever thought you had a purpose? 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. What's the truth? This word, 22 complete. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, their witness, their teaching. That means you, he prays for you today that when you plant a seed, that it is not to, that, it, that, that it does grow and those that are connected down to the that seed that he would count, his last words on the cross, Psalms 22, closing verse, it is done. A seed set aside that is even called a generation, the last generation. Prayer, it's powerful, it's wonderful. 
when you're not of this world, then you need to talk to your father where you're really at home in closest relative you have, our father. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say, in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. All right, bless your hearts. Let's have the 800 number. Uh, the 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. And uh, you're familiar with where it is good. We'll pass on from there all in this, most of this hemisphere. Those of you that listen by short wave, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always good to hear from you. If you have a prayer request, take it to him. He's your father. This being that day of prayer. Father, we come to you around this globe repentant, and we ask that you lead, guide, direct, bless prosper, heal in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Okay, let's get into some questions here real quickly. Mark from California, you said there is no reincarnation and that the elect are from the world that was. I don't understand this. Please explain. Uh, I think you're the best. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, that's uh, quite a compliment. Now, reincarnation is to be born twice of the flesh. No one ever has. That is reincarnation. Um, I have a work done, incarnate uh, and so forth, might help you. You see, this is the only earth age that men actually will be flesh. Therefore, reincarnation or those that claim to be reincarnate, are usually possessed of an evil spirit that lived 400 years ago and can remember many things. It is impossible that anyone be born twice in the flesh. It just doesn't happen. Born again? Yep, in a spiritual body. Ray from Florida, dead in Christ rise in the twinkling of an eye. Are the Christians who have passed on in heaven? Yes, they are. Some on one side of a gulf waiting judgment, and some with their white robes already. But they're all there awaiting judgment. Doesn't mean they have eternal life just because they are the Father. Eva from North Carolina, Ecclesiastes 9.5 concerning the dead not knowing anything. I always thought that they were resurrected when Christ comes. Not the bodies. No way. We are simply changed into our new spiritual bodies. It simply says that the dead are raised first, which means to be absent from this body is to be present with Him, meaning they already have been. And um, quite frankly, bodies deteriorate rather rapidly. There's nothing there to resurrect, all right? Which is good because we're through with it. That's what the Hebrew idiom in Ecclesiastes 9.5 referred to, those that walk under the sun, meaning just the flesh itself, not your soul. Helen, where is it found in the Bible concerning the great pyramids? Isaiah 19.19 most scholars agree that this has to do with the pyramid in Egypt uh, of Giza. Jerry from Illinois, if someone is saved and falls out of God's way, 
Will God still be with them? Will he take their guardian angels away? Will he still protect them? Not, not if they're out, but all they have to do is repent and they're back in that quick. Christ died for our sins and when we repent. Andy from Ohio, in the garden, that serpent that beguiled Eve, was he a handsome man? I believe that why, that's why Eve fell for him. She had never seen anyone like him. Well, that old serpent, the devil, the dragon, uh, you can read of him. He's called the king of Tyre. In Ezekiel 28, he was the most beautiful. God said, I made you the full pattern, means the most beautiful. So, yes, he was, still is. He's coming soon as the spurious Messiah. Okay, we're out of time here. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope it has helped you in your prayer life. It will, beloved. You know, he is our Father, and he's very real. His Word documents that. Well, how can the Word document? Because his prophecies come to pass as they are written. Man's do not. We're brought to you by your tithes and your offerings. If we've helped you, it should change your life. That's your proof. If it has, help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, help us to reach new people as well. Our Father is so very, very good to us. He loves us a great deal. God's elect always carry their own weight. That's just the way it is. How precious to live in this generation. There's one thing that's more important than anything else, and that is this, that you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a beautiful day. Do you know why? Jesus is the living Word. Thank you for joining Shepherd's Chapel in today's study of God's Word. If you would like to further your studies with Pastor Murray, write Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. For a free introductory package, which includes Mark of the Beast audio tape, a monthly newsletter, a complete tape catalog, and a new student tape list, write Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Feel free to call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day to request the free introductory package or to leave questions for Pastor Murray to answer on the air. We at Shepherd's Chapel would like to thank you for joining us each Monday through Friday at this same time for Shepherd's Chapel. of Peter. Here we have two books, First and Second Peter, that, that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great fisherman, which in his gentleness and his kindness brings us uh, two books, the books of Peter, that lead, guide, direct, even in your daily life, that teach and show you how to be happy, how to find that peace of mind, and to know yourself. The books of Peter, I know you're going to enjoy them.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Guess what we're going to discuss today? Christmas. What is the real truth concerning Christmas? It's very important that you know the dates, what transpired, how it came to be, and how a Christian should really react to the nativity of Christ. It is well written in our Father's Word, and as we have just completed the book of Luke, so it's right there, okay? And we're going to cover it. Luke was very concise, and his um, expertise in that we're going to draw from. So uh, with that word of wisdom from our Father concerning that nativity, we go to Luke chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, For as much, Luke states, as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Many, many have written this, too, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word. In other words, they were there, they observed it, and they are eyewitnesses. They can tell us exactly how it came to pass. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, 